I need to be honest that when the book of Colossians was selected to be the next uh, book of the Bible that we would preach through, I never intended nor had any idea that these four chapters would accumulate 50 sermons. I just wanted to be faithful and uh, solemnly take care of that charge that is given in the Bible to pastors. That's found in 2 Timothy chapter 4, which we read like this. It says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. And so with 66 books of the Bible to choose from, from our perspective, it just so happened to be Colossians. But I think from God's perspective, it was precisely orchestrated to be Colossians. Because even through a globe-altering pandemic, this New Testament letter, I don't know how many other churches went to Colossians when COVID hit, but we did, and it happened to be the way that our good shepherd would comfort us and encourage us with his familiar voice. And I know that over the course of this little book, we have deepened our commitment to Christ. We have enlarged our vision of Christ. We have been strengthened in our faith in Christ. I know this because I've seen it in and through you and and in my own life as well. And I thank God for that. Additionally, this Preaching through this book, it's, all, it's also drawn more of his sheep to this fold, this church family. And I know this because it's obvious, none of us are sitting in the same spots that we used to. And I also thank God for that as well. Among the many factors that we might think or attribute to where we are today, I think we owe the credit to God and his never-changing word amidst an ever-changing world. And I know Pastor John, he emailed out a question to the congregation, and many of you responded. Uh, The question was this. Uh, Since last week, Pastor Mike finished the remaining uh, verses of Colossians, uh, will we still get one more sermon from this book? And the majority of the responses that I heard came in, everyone seems to be expecting at least one more sermon. (laughs) Well, my favorite response was one person who said, you know, I'm beginning to think we are the Colossians. And so here we are. Uh, If you still remain uncertain whether we will press on into other portions of Scripture, we will, don't worry, next week. But for this week, what I hope to do is, you know when you go on a vacation or you go traveling and you take a lot of pictures and you come home and the trip's over and you you don't want to forget very quickly all that you've seen. And so we don't, maybe we don't do this as often anymore, but we make a photo album or collect some pictures of the sights and the highlights of things that we saw along the way, the things that we want to remember. I want to do that for us in our time in Colossians here. I want to do that today and put together somewhat of a, a photo album to remind us of what we've seen and to encourage us one more time in this book. And if you ever come across Colossians again, which I hope you do, I pray that you will exalt in and be exhorted in the main central truth that we have seen, and that is how Christ is all. Now we know that this portion of Scripture is just one part of the entire Scriptures. The Bible talks about the big global problem of sin that has brought a curse upon every square inch of God's very good, originally very good, creation. And so we need to see how Colossians addresses that that problem of how the cosmic rebellion requires a cosmic reconciler. And the one whom God, our own merciful creator, promised to send and to restore all things back into its originally intended purposes. And we know through the Old Testament, promises were given, hints were given, and yet the precise details were withheld. We didn't know whom it would be, when he would come, or how he would save. And so we we were left wondering, and then we come to the New Testament. And as the Gospels begin, we see that God's plan of redemption is pivoting from promises given to promises beginning to be fulfilled. And we see how Jesus is the rescuer from the power and the wages of sin, 
and how he came to reconcile all things back to God. And astoundingly, what we learn in the Gospels is that it was God himself in the flesh who took on humanity just like us so that he could come and stand in our place, that he would live to purchase our righteousness for us that he would die to purchase our forgiveness for us, and he would rise to purchase our eternal life for us. Everything that we needed for our salvation was accomplished in the Son of God, in the flesh, at the cross. And we hear him declare, it is finished. And so eternal life is no longer offered to sinners as, as laws to complete but it's offered as good news now that the laws have been completed for us. There is a checklist to earn salvation, but by God's grace, this good news is that the checklist has all been done through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And this unmerited mercy toward us was God's mysterious method to save his people from hell and to sanctify his people for heaven. The gospel is not an obligation to be performed with great effort. It is a gift of grace to be received by simple faith. And then after our Lord's death and resurrection, before he ascends into heaven, he commissions every single one of his followers, all of his disciples, to go into all the world, tell all the nations this good news, and invite them to receive Christ so that they too can enter into the kingdom of God to to escape the wrath that is coming against their sins and to be welcomed into eternal eternal life when he returns. And we know that one man by the name of Paul, who was an extremely unlikely convert, he was mightily used by God to preach the gospel throughout the Roman Empire in the first century. We know that that he would preach Christ traveling strategically from city to city. And all who heard the gospel, many of them were turning away from their sins and turning back to God in faith in Jesus and also in Jesus' saving work on their behalf. And churches were quickly dotting the Roman Empire, the map that was without churches for so long. There, they began to to grow. And at one point, the apostle spends considerably, considerably more time in a city named Ephesus. And it was there that a man by the name of Epaphras was visiting. He heard the gospel. He believed the gospel. And he, when he goes back to his hometown of Colossae, he begins to share the gospel, a place that Paul had not visited at that point. And soon... A group of believers were consistently gathering every Sunday to worship their Savior and await His return. But over time, the joy of their salvation was beginning to be threatened by the culture that surrounded them, causing them to question the sufficiency of Christ. With their cultural heritage, their heathen heritage, and all the religions that they were involved in, the gods that they knew growing up, and now they had turned to Christ, these things were still knocking at the door. And it was forcing them to wrestle with this idea of maybe there's other things that we need to add, other religious rules or super, uh, superstitious spirituality. What else is necessary of more than just faith in Christ? And in that culture that was so spiritually conscious of other gods and other other things, their neighbors could claim this. They could say, I observe holy days, I go to the temple, I follow traditions, I practice the rituals, I offer sacrifices, I I possess secret knowledge, I participate in the feasts, I I abstain from eating those and, and touching that, and I receive visions. And I also worship many gods and the angels as well. And so I know that the Most High God is pleased with me. On the other hand, the Colossian Christians would say this, I believe, I trust in Christ who lived for me, died for me, and rose for me. And you can see that in comparison to what the people were doing to earn or to have eternal life, was very different. And it would have caused those young believers in Colossae to question, you know, is Christ really enough? 
And so Epaphras, their initial leader, leaves the Colossian church and he goes to find Paul because he needs apostolic clarity on this question that they were asking. Is Christ enough? Because there's other things that I would be willing to do. You just got to tell me. Is there more? Because if there, I'll do it. Just tell me what they are. I mean, maybe we were wrong to think that it was just by faith in Christ. Maybe that was just the beginning. And now we need to move on to other things to prove our worthiness and our holiness. And maybe we need to convince God in other ways as well that we should have eternal life. So Paul, is Christ really enough? And thus, the letter to the Colossians was written. And I think that joking comment that I mentioned before of how we are the Colossians, I think it's helpful. Because this is the question that many of us ask also, don't we? We wrestle with these very things. We wonder from time to time whether Christ is enough when we look around, when we consider the other things that we might do or could do. We want to please God, and yet we wonder sometimes, am I really pleasing Him with my life? And so we desperately need to know the answer to this question with confidence. Among all the other questions that Christians can ask, this one is significantly foundational to our faith, to eternal life. And so with that, that important concept hanging in the balance, what I want to do is look at this photo album one more time of our time in Colossians, flip through the pages quickly one more time to encourage you and also to remind you of that repeated refrain that's at the center of this book, which is that Christ is is all. If we open it to the first page, Paul seeks to encourage Christians of the genuine reality of their saved status. Remember, Paul hadn't met these people, but Epaphras had come, and he had talked and reported about what the church was doing and how the church was going. And in verses 4 and 5 of chapter 1, it states that Paul says, I've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, of your love for fellow believers, and of your hope of the future promises in heaven. And that triad there that Paul acknowledges of faith, hope, and love is the evidence that the gospel has taken root in a person's life. And so he says in verses 6 and 7, those three things are the very fruit that the gospel produces if you truly believe. And so he acknowledges this and says, I affirm this. This is what I hear about you, and you are saved if that's true. And then he encourages them in verse 10. He tells them, so since I've heard of you, I am praying that God's Spirit would help you to bear fruit in every good work and increase even more in the knowledge of God. And the reason for that is because this is precisely what pleases the Lord. That's what they wanted to know. Are they pleasing to God? And so I think for us as a church, along with the Colossians, we need to be reassured that the evidence that we can see in our own lives, that we believe the gospel, that of faith, hope, and love, these are the very things that God looks for, that God desires from us, that truly pleases Him. And therefore, they need to increase in our life as we continue to live and await His return. But the question then is, what if they don't? I mean, what if they don't increase enough to impress or to please God because doesn't he demand perfection? And it's here that if we flip the page to the next picture, we see that Paul invites us into a much larger view of who our Savior really is, of who Christ is. And in verses 15 to 20, Paul magnifies the, the total transcendence and the sovereign supremacy of the Savior in whom we are trusting. And he says things like this. He emphasizes his eternal divinity and his position of power and authority over all things. Look at verse 16 and 17. All things were created through him, your Savior, through him and for him, and in him all things hold together. But that's not all. Paul also next emphasizes his perfect humanity, and as the creator of the church, he holds the position of authority over our enemy, namely death. And thereby, verse 18 points out that he is, therefore, preeminent in everything. This is 
who your Savior is. Do you see him like this? And if we do, when we rightly see who he is, he is the greatest being within creation and apart from creation. He is the cosmic creator and redeemer of all things, and we can trust him then that there is nothing that can stop him from accomplishing his mission, not even in saving you and me. May this convince us further, Christ is all. So when it comes to Christians like, like us, regular believers looking to be faithful to God, verses 21 and 22 are, are like the pictures of the before and after so that we can see what Christ has already done in us. So there's pictures there of us now, and this is how we're described. Though you once were alienated from God, hostile toward God, and doing evil against God, what has already taken place, it says he has now already reconciled us back to God. And he does it in his body, in his flesh. And therefore we see that the cross at the cross, that is the place and the time when our salvation was purchased, and that moment that we believed is the time when it was initially applied to us. And there's more than just forgiveness of sins, verse 22 says, but it points out that he also died in his body, in his flesh, for our holiness. So we're forgiven, but he also says it is to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before God. And so that unstoppable power of the God of the universe is carrying out this mission in your life, even today, including the present sanctifying process that is taking place to make you entirely holy, as it says there. So that on the day when you stand before the Lord's judgment, because of His work, you will be found perfectly pleasing to God. And this is that good news that we heard, isn't it? This is the gospel that we have believed. But those pictures of us were from a while ago. And time has moved on. Some of us have have had those pictures, their initial salvation. We see what God does for us and we say, that was a long time ago. But times have changed. Time has gone on. And, And perhaps you're like me and you can say, I've grown some, but I am not as godly as God expects me to be. So what should I be doing in the meantime? What should I be doing now? And it's here. It's with that question, I think, that we begin to wonder, is Christ enough? Is faith in Christ really enough? Is, we get tempted at this point. We look around and we see other religion, other, other spirituality, and say, maybe I need to add those things. But it's here also that Paul says, he gives us one condition that this will take place. We have to meet this one condition and we will be saved and we will be sanctified. And he says it in verse 23. He says, Christ will finish his work if you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from that hope of the gospel that you first heard and believed. Because any time we move away from faith in Christ then, we are undermining the gospel. And we are underestimating the grace and the power of God in his mission. So just as we trusted in Christ at the very beginning of our spiritual life, so now we must continue to do this, to walk by faith in him. He is our hope and nothing else. And this reiterates again how Christ is all. And if that's the case, then There's got to be more than just that past work of the cross, right? I mean, if I need to be sanctified today, even now, until the rest of my life, because I'm not there yet, then something must be going on now. He must be working in me now. And that's what Paul gets to next. He talks about his own ministry, his God-given ministry in verses 24 to 29. He mentions that mystery that he's been called to make known, that of who God sent to save us, and how it is that he accomplished our salvation. And Paul extols God's unfathomable wisdom in that it wasn't just through his son dying for our forgiveness, but it was also through his spirit living in our hearts. 
Verse 27 rejoices in the riches of the glory of this mystery. And he calls it Christ in you. Not just Christ for you, but Christ in you. So God's eternal plan of redemption didn't just see him coming in human form to forgive us, but coming in spirit form to renew us and to transform us. And so we need to understand that for Christians, for those Colossians and for us, if you believe in the gospel, then Christ is in you, even now. And whether you feel like he is or not, here's the truth. The the miraculous truth is that the moment you began to exercise saving faith in him is the moment he began to live by his spirit in you. And so we flip another page in our album, and we see in chapter 2, at the very beginning, we begin to see some of the signs that we saw along our road trip. And most of these signs, they were actually warnings, warning us not to look elsewhere other than Christ to be pleasing to God, to grow spiritually. And that's because we have the very, the the only power for God-pleasing obedience already in us. In Christ. We're told we just need to know him more. We need to experience his life in ours. In verse 3 it says, In Christ are found all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so church, we need to know this. We need to seek to live in him. And strengthening your faith in Christ is the pathway to pleasing God more and more. And I want you to know something, that just like Paul in verses 1 and 2, he or I also seek to struggle for all of you in prayer that your hearts may be encouraged and that you would be more and more convinced that Christ is all. And like verse 5 says, I rejoice when I see the firmness of your faith in him. And so if, if the nucleus of our faith is Christ then what does it look like to live a God-pleasing life in Him? And this is where we come to that initial or primary or core command that Paul gives to the Colossians and to every believer how to live the pleasing life. And he says this in chapter 2, verse 6. You remember the way that you received Christ Jesus, which was by faith? He says, continue. Continue in the very same way. Continue to walk in faith to be sanctified. So from beginning to end, from the beginning of our spiritual journey until the end, faith in Christ is our salvation and it is our sanctification. That means that everything we do, what this looks like, is that we center everything we do on Christ. Verse 7 envisions this as being rooted in him, being built up in him, and being established in him. It's all upon Christ. And if Christ is all, then why would we go anywhere else? It only makes sense to become deeper, to go deeper into Christ. And so the warnings of chapter 2 continue. There's many of them that we see here. If, these, if this is true, then we need to be on guard against all those other things that appear or sound holy and righteous and religious and godly and spiritual because we need to make sure that they are according to Christ. That's what he says. If they're not according to Christ, they are not of Christ. They are not the gospel. And so to reiterate the sufficiency of Christ, he says, don't go looking elsewhere. Continue in faith in Christ. So he dives deeper into some of the results, some of the things that Christ has already done for us in verses 9 to 15. There he says that we are filled. He has filled us with the fullness of God. And that'll blow your mind. And he has has cut out our sinful heart, and he has transplanted a holy heart. He has overcome the power of death over us, and he's given us new life. He has forgiven every single one of our sins, paying our debt in full so that no punishment remains for us. And he's even triumphed over our spiritual enemies, publicly muzzling them so that any future sin that we commit, 
They cannot accuse us before God because there is no sin left that has not been canceled by Christ. If we have Christ, what more do we need? And so in verses 16 to 19, Paul says, if someone suggests that there are some religious rules you also need to follow, do not go there, Paul says, because you have Christ, the very essence of what those rules are pointing to. And then he says, if anyone offers and says there's some experiences that you need to have, some secrets to, 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 to dive into, to find out, he says, don't go there because you have Christ, the very source of what those spirit, spiritual experiences are seeking to experience themselves. And admittedly, verse 23 says, there are things out there that sound good, but they are not of Christ. They are apart from Christ. And therefore, they are man-made religion. And we need to be on guard against those things. They say that these things are going to help you grow spiritually. They're going to make you more godly. And God will be pleased with you. And you'll be worthy. But those things fail to deal with the sin that has made those people unworthy in the first place. And so we need to be committed to this truth. Not to be deluded. Not to be captivated by man-made religion but seek to know and be committed to the truth that Christ is all. And as we flip another page in our album, we move into chapter 3 with this this solid ground. And Paul, in these pictures that he's going to show us next, he changes the focus of the lens. He moves from the theological focus to a practical focus. Having established this fact that we are counted dead to sin— And now alive to God in Christ, we now need to live accordingly. We can and we will live in a way that reflects our future eternal life. And so this is why he says in verse 2 of chapter 3, he says, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Because your new life has already begun. You are pleasing to God spiritually, but you are also beginning to do this to please Him practically, to live real holiness in your own life. The old is gone, the new has come. If you're in Christ, you are a new creation. And so verses 5 to 14 determine that a wardrobe makeover is is due, is necessary. That we are to put off the old rags of unrighteousness that no longer fit us, this new person that we've become, And we need to put on the garments of godliness. This is just a natural product, more of the fruit that Christ is really in you and saving and sanctifying you. So we need to remember, though, that these commands to kill sin and these commands to put on or to to do holiness, to do what is right, they are not to be done apart from Christ, but precisely because Christ is in you and you continue to walk in faith in him. His Spirit is in us to serve us for this very purpose, to make us gradually, progressively, more and more holy and pleasing to God. So this is the life that we must live. We, we fight against the, the flesh, the, 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 the works of the flesh, and we begin, because Christ is in us, to produce the fruit of the Spirit with the help of His resurrection power in us. And those who are genuine believers, Paul gives a lot of different evidences or fruit. We will give living proof as well. Some of which are that we will abound in love. We will abound in thanksgiving to God. We will abound in forgiving one another. And it's all because that we are letting the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. We are letting the the word of Christ dwell in us richly. And over time, the best way to, 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 to figure out if someone truly believes is that over time, even sometimes really slowly, a person's character will eventually become more and more like Christ. It will look like Christ. And our life's goal will align with verse 17, which says that whatever we do in word or deed, we do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. So more than just superficial or superstitious practices that we might add in to make us think that we feel more holy, to hope that this will convince God that we are more worthy, doesn't a life that is described here, doesn't a life 
that increasingly reflects the Son of God and His perfect obedience, isn't that what God desires? Isn't that what pleases Him? The mystery of God's salvation of sinners is that through faith, Christ in you will make Christ-likeness flow out of you. And it just reiterates again how Christ is all. The remainder of chapter 3 identifies some of the particular things that pertain to the spe- special relationships that we all find ourselves in. If you're a spouse, there's, there's, there's ways that God has designed the marriage relationship to work. We are to live in certain ways. That's what Christ is in us to help us with. If we are a child, how we deal with our parents. If we are a parent, how we uh, address our children. Whether we're a boss or an employee or whatever it might be. There's more ways that Christ in us will change the way that we live our lives and please God in the process. And even in chapter 4, there's more gospel fruit. Christ in us makes us, for example, steadfast in prayer for missionary evangelists and also carefully living our own lives for personal evangelism. And on the last pages of our photo album, we remember some of the people that we met, that we thought of, that we considered along the way. Others, some are familiar, some are less so. And they were just other Christian comrades that Paul was working with. They sent their greetings. They worked for the kingdom of God because Christ is in them. They are committed to God's mission, and they are committed to God's people as well. And their example of what we saw there is for our encouragement. And in the very same way, just like Christ is in them, Christ is in us. And he will cause us to uniquely contribute to the mission of God. And then our example will be an encouragement to others as well. And so as we close our photo album of our adventures in Colossians today, I pray that each one of us is able to answer that question that initiated this letter. Is faith in Christ and in Christ alone truly enough to save and to sanctify you? And the answer that Paul gave us over and over is that Christ is all. And whether you're unable to unpack Colossians in the same way or not, you know where to go to persevere in the faith that you have in the gospel of Christ. You know where you need to go to encourage your hearts to continue to be steadfast, not shifting to anything other than Christ, And you know where to go to continue to pursue, to walk by faith in He who lives in you. And if we do this, if we do this, God will root us down, He will build us up, and He will establish us in Christ Himself. And it's the only way, the way, the truth, and the life to be able to stand holy before God and to enter into His kingdom. And so I pray that you are encouraged in Christ today. And let's commit ourselves that every time we gather, that we would encourage one another in this truth, and all the more as we see the day of his return drawing near. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way that you have helped us to understand the gospel. It's much greater than we've ever imagined. Much greater than our minds can even comprehend. And yet what you have revealed to us, I pray that it would root root down in our hearts and in our minds, that it would strengthen our faith in you, that we would see Christ more clearly, understand the gospel more truly, and live more holy and obediently to you because you have given us Christ and Christ in us. I thank you, Father. There's nothing greater than to understand this and to believe this and to live accordingly. And I pray that this church would long be served by what we've seen through this book. And I pray that the next one ahead would do the very same thing for us. So we thank you for Christ, and thank you that Christ is all. We praise you, we worship you, and we love you. Help us, Father, to be faithful to you until the end. In Jesus' name, amen.